Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and you know, I've taken to letting Skeptico listeners guide me on who I should talk to. And today's show is a great example of how wonderful that can be when you let other people take the reins. I am almost embarrassed to tell you that I wasn't aware of the tremendous body of work, you can see some of the books on the screen, that have been generated by the husband and wife writing team of Rob and Trish McGregor. Both separately have each become award-winning authors as well as together have done some amazing work. But on so many of the topics that we love to talk about here on Skeptico and we like to dive into deeply as they have. So synchronicities, remote viewing, UFOs, ETs, spirit communication, astrology, Wicca, a lot of other stuff that we haven't talked as much about. These folks are just a tremendous well of information. And as I just alluded to, it's quality stuff. It's not like people, they crank out a lot of books, but there's a lot of great stuff in these books. So I'm blown away. I'm super excited to have them on and to meet them and have a chance to talk to them. Rob, Trish, thank you both so much for joining me on Skeptico. Well, thank you, Alex. Now, if our dog suddenly shows up in this picture, it's because he's right under the table here. <laughs> Thanks for inviting us. You guys, as I just mentioned, we're going to be talking a lot about these many, many books you've written, and we're going to play a little game that I like to play called Skeptico <laughs> Jeopardy, where you pick the topics and mm. then we go where you drive us. But as... <laughs> as I'm often guilty of, I sometimes kind of jump in there and pick the first one. And here, I guess we have to talk about books. Yeah, it started basically when I met uh, Trish. I was working as a newspaper reporter on a daily paper in Hollywood, Florida, and I was assigned to do an article on how the Cuban refugees would come to Florida and the United States after the Cuban uh, boat lift in 1980, and this is like a couple years later, how they were integrating into our society. Trish was uh, teaching English as a second language at Florida International University, and so I interviewed her, and uh, we started talking And uh, after the interview, and it just turned out that uh, we both had read all of these Seth books. And by we, Jane Roberts. By Jane Roberts, and we knew no one else who had, not, not only had they not I'd never heard of read them. the books or heard of them, but had no interest in, in the subject matter. So it was uh, nice to meet somebody who had similar interests and things went from there. Well, that's fantastic. You know, and as I mentioned earlier, you've written on a lot of different topics and we're going to talk a lot about many of the different ones. We're going to talk about synchronicities, uh, uh, especially because a lot of people are interested in that. And you guys have an interesting theory about how synchronicities may be at the core of a lot of these different phenomena and the, the, how they all might be linked. But I, I'd like to know more about your personal journey through these different topics, and in particular, because this is a show that really likes to focus on science. And on one hand, you all don't claim to be doing science, your authors, but I did gain an appreciation for maybe a little bit of that newspaper reporter vibe that you have in that the accounts that you tell, I get the feeling that you've tried to vet them in some pretty serious ways and in some of the work that you present to back up some of these ideas that, especially when you're starting out, were really unacceptable to people and have become much more mainstream. But I felt like you did go to you know great lengths to show the seriousness and the serious people that were involved in that. Do you want to speak to that at all? I'll tell you one thing. I, I first read about synchronicity when, when I was 18, and I had picked up an I Ching book, the Chinese book of divination, and Jung wrote the introduction in 1949, and that's the place where he first publicly talked about synchronicity. I thought, wow, this explains a lot, you know, because at that time I was also learning astrology, which Jung studied. And 
when I met Rob, one of the first questions I asked him, I said, hey, do you know what synchronicity is? <laughs> this was like my test question. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I think I do. And he started talking about it. And we actually, our, the first book we tried together was on synchronicity, but it didn't work. Yeah, that so, was right at the beginning. And that was our first attempt at a nonfiction book and it didn't go anywhere. We just weren't prepared at that point to write a book on uh, synchronicity. Uh, and so, you know, we had other uh, things going. Trish's first novel came out and I got a nonfiction uh, project, ghostwriting project with a um, uh, corporate uh, executive from Washington, D.C. And uh, we both quit our jobs at that point. Uh, <laughs> Then we ran out of money five months later and had to, go, had to take part-time jobs. Yeah, I took a, uh, actually, it was a full-time job on a, daily, a weekly newspaper, but I was able to do it part-time. And Trish was teaching English as a second language at a night uh, after-school program at a high school. It was adult ed. Adult ed. And, uh, you know, we, we um, did that for a year. And then that's when Trish's novel sold. And I got the, the other um, project for... Um, we actually started out as freelance so magazine. We're, yeah, we were, first we were doing magazine, uh, selling magazine articles, and we were doing pretty well selling them, but the problem was getting paid. <laughs> and, uh, very slow and very low pay. Uh, until we got hooked up with Omni Magazine, where they, I think they paid us 75 cents a word. And they paid a buck. So it, was, yeah. it was good. Uh, and we got a lot of assignments uh, from Pamela Weintraub, that editor. And, uh, and that's how we met Betty Hill and Bud Hopkins. Yeah. Introduced yep. us to old UFO stuff. <laughs> you know, one of the things we're going to have to do during this show is deal with a lot of name dropping. And it's not name dropping. I shouldn't say that because that has a negative connotation. But one of the things people are going to have an appreciation for is seen it all, done it all, been there, all these people that you've encountered, which are just tr tremendously important people in a number of these different fields. And I've jumped over to the UFO topic, even though. I have up on the screen synchros. So let me <laughs> pull back to the synchros thing, synchronicities, because I think we've talked about these a, a number of times on the show. And I want to kind of approach it from a couple of different angles. One, you've written several different books on synchronicities, and you've chronicled some amazing synchronicities, these kind of uh, coincidences that go way, way beyond coincidences in our life. But I also wanted to connect it to the fact that on this show, we've also looked at the undeniable science that seems to suggest that there's something real going on here. So if you look at Dr. Dean Radin and his work on right. presentiment, it's kind of pointing in that direction. Dr. Julia Mossbridge at uh, Northwestern as well. And a friend of our show, Andy, Dr. Andy Piquet, who's looked at dreams and synchronicity and the mm -hmm. unbelievable connection statistically. But let's start maybe from the beginning and talk about synchronicities, because if people pick up this book that I have up on the screen, The Seven Secrets of Synchronicity, they'll find some really good kind of factual stuff about what synchronicities are, some common understandings you know this thing of the the number thing is is always interesting to people That's people great. ask me the 11, 11. i have to say the other day yesterday i was preparing i was getting ready to prepare for this interview i wake up i look at the clock 444 you know <laughs> so happens on the day that i'm doing the the prep work for the people That's that funny. are the synchronicity people but i'm sorry please let's talk about synchros wherever you want to start well you know okay one of the things that was surprising to me, I kept rereading Jung's uh, autobiography, his biography, and he, throughout his life, had a lot of numerical synchros, synchronicities that happened to him. And his theory was that every number is an archetype of energy. And you keep seeing that particular number until you figure out, sometimes you never figure it out, but until you figure out what the message is. That's how Jung approached it. And another man, um, Bernard Bateman, you need to have him on your show. He's a psychiatrist, visiting psychiatrist at the University of Virginia. And he's really the first psychiatrist to take on a serious study of synchronicity. Since Jung. Yeah, since Jung. So. Yeah. And I'd like to uh, just mention um, a couple of our best stories that are personal synchronicities, if I might, uh, that are would we consider pretty astonishing. Sometimes people have their own personal synchronicities. They tell you and they're 
very meaningful to that person, but then you think, then you tell somebody else and the other person well, oh, doesn't huh? quite <laughs> get it. Uh, but these, I think, are pretty dramatic. Uh, this one took place in Venezuela at the airport oh, as yeah. you're leaving uh, the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, it was at a time when the Colombian drug lords were moving cocaine uh, to Miami, but they weren't moving it out of Bogota anymore. They were they shifted to Venezuela, and so there was a, a large present army presence uh, at the border there at the airport. And so we come up with our our luggage and uh, to go through. But just in front of us, there's a man who doesn't have any luggage. He just has a briefcase. He's dressed in suit, very tall, and he's wearing a three piece suit. Kind of looked out of place in a way. Uh, and he puts down the briefcase, unlocks it, opens it up. We're standing right behind him. And there's these kids, like 16, 17 years old, with machine guns kind of leaning over. Uh, we're wondering, what's this going to be? There's only one thing in that briefcase, and it's a book called Fevered, written by Trish. But I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> even prove it because it was written under a pseudonym. Oh, we didn't even talk no, about it. I mean, it was too tense of a situation, but... That blew us away, you know, and, and fe it was a kind of a fevered uh, yeah, it was. Uh, tension there uh, as well. And, uh, you know, we just looked and got to what? <laughs> so that, uh, that was a good one. One other one I might mention is I used to be a windsurfer and uh, I would windsurf sometimes on a neighborhood lake. And one day I went out and I just, I was too excited. The wind was blowing good and I was too excited and got jumped jumped on my board a little too soon before I didn't take my billfold out. And at some point, uh, I went down and lost the billfold. But I really wasn't aware, certain that that's where I lost it. But I just knew after I came home from windsurfing, I didn't have a billfold anymore. <laughs> and so the thing is, Trish, I talked to Trish about it, and he said, yeah, it's probably in the bottom of the lake. Uh, but I had the feeling that I, it was going to come back to me. Uh, it's just an odd thing. I just, I didn't contact any of the credit cards. I didn't try to get a new driver's license. Uh, so three or four days go by and I get a telephone call and a man says, Rob McGregor? Yeah. I said, oh, I'm glad you're alive. I was, <laughs> I was fishing in this lake with a net and came up with your boat and I thought your body might be down there as well. And so he finds it and then he, uh, we decided to meet at his house, and uh, it's a man from India, and it turned out he was having a big party at his house the Sunday I went there, and it was, it was like moving into a foreign country, about 40 <laughs> different people in the house, hanging out in the garage and all over, and, uh, Indian food, and uh, so I'm looking for this guy. There's three guys there with the same name, and I finally get to the one who owns the house. He gives me the billfold. All my cards, all my money is in there, and I look at him, hey, I just met you last week. He, he has a lawn service and he came and knocked on my door and advertising his, his services. I talked to him for about five minutes. And, uh, and so here I met him again. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's a really unusual one. <laughs> you know, there's a couple things about that story that I think are really worth talking about a little bit further. One is that, you know, as we've shown on this show, there's these different levels to these different paranormal phenomena. And, and like one is we feel a need to prove it, you know? So we want to talk about, we want to pull young in or we want to pull in some other authority or like I was doing, we want to talk about the science that's been done on it. But then in another, we, we quickly get past that and we get to the personal, you know? And that's something I've experienced and I, I've experienced both myself directly. A lot of times people will have medium readings and it'll be exactly like you were saying, Rob. They'll say, you know, this little thing came through that when I tell it to anyone else, it seems insignificant. But to me, it was the Good most point. meaningful little bit of information that would come through. Right. Yeah. And that brings us to the point of start to ask some really, really deep questions. Is Who is orchestrating this? For what purpose and meaning might it be orchestrated? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it our spirit guides? Are we potentially being deceived? Is there a grand order to everything? And is it working out in a clockwork-like fashion? I think your work 
particularly with synchros, brings us to the point where we can start asking those deeper questions. So let's do it. What do you, what do you <laughs> think about that? Uh, uh, it, after I had initially read Jung's introduction to the Cheng, I, I, I actually started experiencing which, what I thought at the time was coincidences, but they were synchronicities. And once Rob and I, years later, got around to writing The Seven Secrets of Synchronicity, we realized that there were really seven categories. There, there could actually be more because we, we had other categories too, but the editor we were working with said, oh, let's keep seven secrets. You know, we like that alliteration of the, of the S's. So we did a part two on it. But one of the things we found is, okay, when you're at uh, an intersection in your life, okay, you're going to move or you're going to get married, you're going to have a baby, you know, big, big life events. That's when synchronicities seem to happen most frequently, right? That's one thing. Yeah, that's one thing. Also, when you travel, and you're outside of your comfort zone, then you also seem to experience synchronicity. Sometimes they're warnings, sometimes they're confirmations, um, and sometimes they're tricksters. So when you were talking about are they good or bad, I mean, I, I had a trickster synchronicity that kind of kicked me off. Um, I had written, I was writing a, a trilogy for Tor, and I wanted the second book to be to involve time travel. So Rob and I were in Orlando at a Scottish festival and I was looking at clothing that they had there and I looked at the label in one shirt and it said time travel. I thought, wow, okay, here's my confirmation. This, this is what my second book, you know, that's a good idea. When I passed it by my editor, she said, no, I don't want time travel. So I thought, all right, that's a trickster. You know, it, it was a manifestation of what I wanted, but not what was going to be. So you were talking about asking the question about what's the source of these uh, synchronicities, these meaningful coincidences. Uh, we feel that there's like a deeper level of reality that exists where everything is interconnected. And let, uh, the explicate as... Um, it's the, the implicate is the inner. Or the Im implicate, yeah. excuse me, uh, as David Bohm, the quantum physicist, described it. And then there's the explicate, which is the physical world, where things do not seem to be all interrelated. They seem to be just the opposite, oftentimes. But what synchronicity is, is right at the border between the implicate and the explicate. Because it's something that's peeking through from the uh, implicate order where everything is interconnected. So it's, it's like a clue, like... Uh, people are more religious, like they, there's a book called God Winks. You know, they see it as uh, a religious thing. Yeah, I, I get that part of it, but I don't think that really gets at the question of, which, which can be asked in a number of different ways, but it's like, who's orchestrating it, and for what purpose? And we don't, I'm not fixed that we have to come down with a solid answer one way or another, and I wouldn't trust it if we did, because I think the data as we're, as you've encountered it in, in, in your other work, like when we're going to go over and talk about ETs and abduction slash contact experience, good ET, bad ET, when we're talking about uh, demons, when we talk about hungry ghosts, or we talk about angels, you know, we, we have a lot of different stuff going on in these extended realms. And so uh, I'm all for this idea that, that you're putting forward, which is really fascinating, which is synchros are this particular means of communication in that kind of in-between zone that, that, that might have a particular purpose, might serve a particular function as a way of communication, but it, it does drive me towards those questions of, you know, who is orchestrating it, for what purpose, and... I, I think it's all, I honestly believe that it's all internal. You know, if, if somebody doesn't believe that a coincidence is meaningful, they're not gonna experience anything you know, generally. Um, generally, if, generally. Yeah. I like to say, because sometimes, right? I Some, mean, you can see this in your own work, right? Sometimes <laughs> it'll come and just beat you over the head. I mean, sometimes yeah. it'll be really subtle and you have to pay attention to it to get the meaning. Other times it's like, no, I'm yeah. telling you, this is it. Sometimes they even pass right over by us. Uh, over us, we have a, 
of a synchronicity, uh, something small, and we don't even think about it at the time. But then later, think, hey, we just hey, that was sick. <laughs> So, and a lot of people who don't think, we think about this all the time, we've written so many books about it, but uh, a lot of people who aren't really paying attention, uh, aware of synchronicity, uh, I think they have these coincidences and they just uh, may think about it for a second or two and then move on their life. What's well, really interesting, we have neighbors who have two children. And when our first book came out, I gave my neighbor the book and she read it and then she came, she said to me, Trish, I think I've had a lot of synchronicities in my life. And then her kids started coming over and saying, Miss Trish, Miss Trish, we've had some synchronicities. <laughs> and it becomes so part of it is, is that awareness, you know, that, wow, okay, I get this. And as you're more aware, they, yeah. they happen more often. So. Okay, but guys, what does that mean? Again, we're, we're describing it, which is awesome. I mean, you, you guys have, uh, I, I don't want to sound... To this to be taken the wrong no, way. No, no, hats no, no, off no, to you no, for no, doing no. this work and for amassing it. And again, folks, if you have any doubts like that, you know, they're kind of being fluffy with this, go <laughs> read these accounts. They're amazing. And we can go back to the fact that these people are careful about collecting accounts. They don't just go take stories that they pick up in the street. They try and verify them in many cases to a certain extent, to a certain extent. And like people will come on their website and share synchronicities, but they won't just stop and take them verbatim. They'll go and yeah. email the person and follow up and, and really try and verify it. But again, we're describing it. We, we have contradictions all over the place, right? That, that must trouble you too in terms of... Yeah, it does. Because what, you know, for instance, you know, if you look at the number 11 or 1111, and when we started looking into that, I was kind of blown away. I thought, okay, we're... we're how can there be so many 1111s, you know? I mean, we were in Colombia last year, and I found out that Cartagena was freed, from, found its independence from Spain uh, on November 11th, 1111. I thought, now, how, how can this be, you know? So I don't know who's orchestrating okay. yeah. it. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I do think it's that underlying that, that implicate order of things. And that we exist in that order as well as we exist right. here. It's so, so that's fair, fair enough. I mean, if that's your answer, I'm going to just try and pin you down because I don't <laughs> want to do that. If that's your answer, fair enough, is that we are orchestrating it. It's the Tulpa thing. It's the we are co-creators of our reality. So, of course. Okay. We haven't. I, I buy that. I buy that. I buy that. Yeah. Right. But then I jump over to the other, to some of the other work. ET is, is real. Okay. A lot of people don't want to accept that. It always amazes me when people go, yeah, I believe in UFOs, but I don't believe in ET. You know, it's like, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. So, so ET is real, no matter how we look at it. And we'll dive into that in a minute, but there is, a, a being, a species, a, a manifestation of consciousness that is playing in this in-between realm in a way that we don't understand. Jump right. over the spirit experience or the mediums. They're now talking to spirits who are in this extended realm in a way that we don't totally understand, but seems to have some ability to access synchronicities or affect synchronicities in our life so that in a way i'm not saying it completely does but it kind of stands a little bit in contrast with this we are creating our, our reality well we're creating our reality but these other beings are there too and they seem yeah. to be saying it yeah, i agree i mean a lot of times you know with, with spirit contact in particular you, there is interaction you know I, I don't know if they're creating the synchronicity but Something is creating this synchronicity. And you know I think I mean? the, these higher beings can move between the physical realm and inter, uh, between dimensions and non-physical. that can appear, appear mm -hmm. to us, not necessarily coming on a UFO, but just manifesting to us. Uh, and we're writing a book right now with a uh, woman who is uh, a retired veterinarian who has had to, to repeated. 20, uh, since since the <laughs> uh, early not earlier mid nineties, she's been having these experiences and is continuing to have these daily experience with. She doesn't want to call them aliens; she calls them beings, and uh, she describes them. And uh, she's one of these people who actually likes this experience, <laughs> uh, and she doesn't consider 
that she's being abducted, they come to her. Uh, every afternoon, she spends two to three hours in her bed with them. Uh, they're not in the bed, they're around <laughs> the bed. And like one of them is this creature that's about seven feet tall and looks like a praying mantis. And I would go through the ceiling if I saw that thing. I'd lose it. <laughs> <my bed. laughs> and it's got, stands at the bottom of the bed and it's got these long arms and there's this manipulation that. But as she says, who's better equipped to investigate an alien species than a veterinarian? Interesting. That's an interesting angle yeah. I hadn't heard before. Yeah, she sent Rob some recordings that she made, and they freaked me out. They sound insectile. You know, like if you were standing in an orchard or something, and every cricket and insect in the world was singing. And she said, you know, we, we've checked her out. Uh, we've known her for a number of years, and she's a legitimate uh, contactee and uh, has an incredible story. And I think this story could be the modern day equivalent of communion because it's interdimensional, it's physical and non-physical uh, connections. Uh, and it's, it's a fascinating story. She, it's a lot of, a lot of it is about out of body travel that they have pulled her out of her body and travel with her in different dimensions. Uh, she has uh, <clears throat> lots of those stories that are really fascinating. And she feels that what they're doing is they're helping her to evolve um vibrationally right right isn't that how she puts yeah, it yeah and she's she's feels that she's living the future this mm -hmm. is what humans are evolving to to become both physical and non-physical beings that we move between the two realities in other words we get away from the nuts and bolts idea of space travel mm -hmm. and the travel through our minds through consciousness consciousness uh and can manifest physically elsewhere well that, that's a topic you guys have discussed and covered extensively in some of your prior books. I just pulled up Aliens in the Backyard and Beyond Strange. I mean, you have amazing cases of uh, contact slash abduction. I think that's a, a really interesting topic that I'd like to dive into you with. You know, one of the guests that I've had on recently, and there's several guests who are doing this research with the Free Foundation. I don't know if you've heard them, but Ray Hernandez and Rudy Shields. Oh, right. they're, they're down there in Florida. And uh -huh. the things they've done, and Ray's been on the show multiple times, is they've looked at experiencers and they've tried to look at a, that experience scientifically through mm -hmm. a very academic survey. You know, and you know the drill, if you do surveys the right way, you can get good data. I mean, that's how they do, uh -huh. that's how they get data on pain or depression. You know, you have to go ask people, but you ask them with enough questions and you do it in a way that kind of asks it multiple ways. And if you do it carefully, you can get good data. Well, their data surprisingly comes back and it is very much in favor of, I guess, that last contactee that you were mentioning. They find that overwhelmingly people have a positive contact experience and that the more experiences they have, the more they understand their experiences to be positive. They see spiritually transformative experiences throughout these. They see healing experiences that are kind of pretty undeniable. People can also they develop psychic abilities too, don't they? Psychic abilities, which is again, maybe similar to the near death experience where, uh -huh. where people do that. But at the same time, that stands in contrast with some of the cases that you've reported that I think we have to take very seriously and we have to respect where people are coming from. Some people are having traumatic abduction experiences that we can't really put in any other way. No one wants to be taken against their will and have these kind of weird medical experiments done. Right. And people are reporting that. And there's good documentation for that where people come back and they don't, their clothes are switched with someone else's right. clothes, their clothes are on backwards, and all yeah. this kind of strange stuff. It, it, it is really terrifying. And then to see your children, which in a lot of cases, people see their children being uh, abducted right. or having this contact experience. So this idea of the good alien versus the bad alien is something that I think really needs to be wrestle to the ground a little bit more and who better to do it than you two so. well, i don't think there's just one species here you know just like we're not just one you know we have blacks and mulattoes and whites and you know we're we're as varied i think as these aliens are in di different cultures yeah different, different cultures systems and uh, different intentions so 
so I think some of them are here maybe for uh, not the best uh, motives for the future of the human race. Others may be very neutral and just coming for harvesting our resources that they can make use of, and others may be benevolent and here to, to help us, but, but not in a way that we want, we might want them to, to land on the uh, White, White House, House lawn, and, uh, make an agreement that, uh, you know, that they're, they don't seem to be, think that is the best way, that we have to do it ourselves. Uh, and uh, they're maybe helping behind the scene, but not in, uh, not in a way that concrete, a concrete way that we see on a daily basis. We had in in one of the cases we talk about in Aliens in the Backyard about this French Canadian who was, had this experience in his backyard. Over a period of time, um, we asked him. He, he was carrying around a vial of holy water, of holy water, and. So Rob said, send it to us. We'd like to take it up to Casa Dega, the spiritualist community in Central Florida, and have a friend of ours who's a psychic a psychometrist, psychometrist yeah. read it. So, a psychometrist is somebody who takes an object knows, yeah. and uh, reads, it. Re reads the object. But she also is, a, is medium mystic. So I went in there and I had the vial, and she used to be an RM. So Kathy immediately thought it was a vial of urine <laughs> that I was bringing here. I said, no, no, I didn't tell her what it was, but I just started laughing. So she reads it and she goes, oh, they did it for fun. <laughs> In other words, they... Entertainment, she said. Entertainment. That, that can, was the whole... That kind of freaked us out that there, this, is, uh, this can be entertainment for them. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that was something unexpected. That was, yeah, that really was. You know, I, I had a similar uh, story from a guy who I interviewed, just terrific guy, who is, a, we have a connection, Rob, he's a longtime uh, yogi, longtime meditator for 20 years, was under the, uh, uh, the TM guy. Anyways, he, he had gone to India and had an in incredible series of encounters with a number of uh, mystics, gurus, and stuff like that. And one guy took, he, took him kind of under his wing and said, okay, I'm going to tell you the truth. You know, you, I can see by your aura, your consciousness has evolved so far. Here's what you need to take it the next way. And there's these visitors out there that you're going to connect with. And <laughs> lo and behold, he connects with these, has these amazing experiences. So he claims with people from the star system of Sirius and he travels out of body experience. But the point of the story without just being another alien story is that's what they said. They said, you know, like oh. he said, why do you, why do you show up in these spaceships? Because <laughs> obviously you can communicate telepathically. You can travel telepathically. And he goes, that's fun. It's interesting. Yeah, no, that was basically. To do. <laughs> and, and, and I think, you, you know, the part of that that really resonates with me is that it's the as below, so above. You know, we often say as above, so below. But I think of it as as below, so above. We have people doing things for a bunch of different reasons. And we have some people whose actions we just totally can't understand, either because they're doing something really horrible and they're hurting people and being evil. And, you know, we see that and we go, why would they do that? And we see other people that are incredibly altruistic and just want to love and help other people. And we see everything in between. The people are obsessed with, kind of gaining things and all this. And why wouldn't there be that same kind of diversity yeah. of consciousness yeah. in these extended yeah. realms? And moreover, that's not only logical, that to me seems to be what your data is speaking to. This thought was just came into my head. About a year ago, um, we got a, an email from Whitley Strieber and he said, do you guys know where Casa Dega is? And synchronistically, we were just leaving Casa Dea because I had taught an astrology workshop there. I said, sure, we know where it is. We go up there a lot. He goes, well, can you meet up, me up there in a couple of weeks? We set a date. And one of the interesting things that came out of that, that meeting was he feels that abductions are not happening as frequently anymore because whoever, whatever species or race was doing them, they have everything they need so that now there's more of a, the, the abductions aren't as important anymore. And the way Whitley talks, I mean, it's like they're, the ETs maybe exist in the same sphere, the same dimension as the dead. And that's why people, sometimes when people were abducted or had encounters, 
they would see a loved one who had passed on. I got to jump in there with the inquiry to perpetuate doubt skeptico thing. I'd like to see the data on abductions aren't as frequent. Cause I'll tell you one place I hear like people say UFO sightings aren't as frequent as they were before. Simply not true. They're just more. No, that is true. I mean, yeah. Know, if you go count the numbers on YouTube, they're, they're certainly, I don't know if they're more, but they're, they're on the rise. Less. <laughs> I wonder the same thing with abduction based on what we've just, said you know there's all these different visitors throughout time right i mean uh, forever so the 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 that we live in some special time when the aliens are ready to wrap it all up i mean maybe just show me the data and, and i can be able yeah to well maybe that it, that it's this, the so-called bad race <laughs> that was doing these abductions and these medical experiments maybe they're the ones who have kind of backed off but if so then let's bring in the good guys. <laughs> I agree. You know, I've got, the good guys. I, I kind of said I'm going to do this skeptical Jeopardy thing, and then I've kind of hogged <laughs> the board. So hey, wh where do we want to go? What, what topic do you feel like we want to share with people? Spirit contact. Remote got, okay, let's talk about spirit contact. And we already did a little bit. Right. And one of the main questions I'd have regarding spirit contact is, in which way do we understand spirit contact and spirit communication to be different from what we've already been talking about, um, synchros or ET communication in the extended realm? And also, I, I have to ask you, maybe if you want to share with folks the rock in the graveyard story. Because <laughs> that I was a weird a great, one. Great one. And, and it also... Uh, you know, one, one thing people will find it when, in your books is you guys are so brave and open and you share about your, your life together as a couple and you share about with your, your daughter. And, and this is a story that encompasses that, a kind of a family story. Yeah. yeah. People kind of think we're weird too, though, Alex. You have to understand <laughs> that. <laughs> okay, tell them so a lot. We went to a vacation to the Dominican Republic. Uh, it was a kind of a windsurfing vacation for my daughter and I, we're both windsurfers. And... We got this uh, hotel we looked up <coughs> online and it seemed really nice right on the water. And it, uh, it was kind of U-shaped with uh, parts on either side and the back and looked like a nice garden in the middle and then the ocean on the other side. The garden actually was a graveyard. And, uh, and we were right in the back on the first level, so our porch overlooked the uh, graveyard. And Megan did not like that. Yeah, our daughter, our daughter Megan was about 12, years, 12, 13 years old at the time. And she didn't uh, like having the graveyard right there. But uh, so one day we saw that the gate was open. So I said, let's go in and see what's going on. And so we walked in there. And the first thing we see is like half of a windsurfer sticking up as a, uh, a grave marker. And we had thought this was some ancient graveyard that had been there, you know, historical one. But this guy had just died four months ago. And that was half of his uh, was young, windsurfer too. was his, uh, where, wherever the wind blows, I will be. That was what it said on it <laughs> and, and his name, which was cool. Uh, and then we see the grave uh, digger. Grave, the grave digger. digger. Yeah, he comes up to us and he says, come on, I, I have to show you this. There, uh, the sand here goes up all the time. And so there's graveyards, and layers. Graves, <laughs> layers of graves. And so he was digging a grave. To, to bury somebody, and he came upon another grave from uh, an earlier gra the earlier graveyard, and he wanted to show it to us, and uh, we thought, oh, that's okay, we don't have to <laughs> have to see what's over there. So, <laughs> so on the way out, Rob yeah, picks I up think, a rock that yeah. was near the windsurfer's yeah, grave, and, and put it in my pocket. Then by this time, Megan is saying, I want to get away from this <laughs> graveyard. So we talked to the management, and they. They put us in the, the building on the side, which was completely empty at the time, except for us. And so we, it, the, now the porch looked right out on the ocean. However, the door to the apartment was actually closer to the graveyard than we had been before. But so that night, we uh, go to bed fairly early, about 11, 10, 11 o'clock. Uh, Megan is sleeping. And, and she's in a separate room in the back. She's in a separate room in the back. And we both fall asleep, and suddenly we hear this sound, boom, 
boom. It sounded like a wrecking ball. Like a wrecking ball the hitting building. the side of the building. And uh, it had a very resonant sound. And at first, I, now, am I dreaming this or is this <laughs> happening? And uh, it's just my personal dream. And so this happened three times, three, three bangs like that three times. And after the, the ninth one, the ninth bang, I sat up and Trish simultaneously <laughs> sat up. She had heard the same thing. And it was this sense, there was something very, I don't know, enlightening about it. I, I just felt really filled with uh, uh, a very positive sense of this. Um, yeah, we weren't afraid. Strange. It wasn't frightening. Not, nothing frightening at all. Strange, and, but and, not... and then the television came on. We hadn't even been watching television, and uh, so it, it was like spirit contact. But it wasn't uh, the spirit contact where you're connecting with a family, deceased family member. It was because of the rock. <laughs> so <laughs> the next day, he put that rock yeah, back into the graveyard. Yeah, so I returned the, the rock to the graveyard. But it was a, it was an interesting experience because it was such a resonant sound that felt both inner and outer uh and yeah. and megan never heard anything yeah and she never heard anything. which is probably good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's an incredible story and you know we we could like we were talking about before we could really drill into how you knew it was the rock and you know did that really <laughs> well that was just my sense i mean well, but isn't that the way it is i mean that's like we we're talking it about is before. it's like that's what is meaningful. And that's the mm -hmm. connection again to your synchronicities. If it's right. not meaningful to you, then it probably, it ain't crap. Yeah, we actually thought there might have been an earthquake. So uh, <laughs> we uh, went to the management and asked them if anything, there had been any reports of earthquake or anything like that. And then we told them what happened. They said, oh, that's, that's the spirits. Uh, <laughs> but they're friendly. They're good. Well, let's talk about all that and let's talk about a couple of these books, The Secrets of Spirit, Communication and Synchronicity and the Other Side. So this topic of spirit communication is something you guys have written about and from that story and as well as your work in mediums and in spiritualist communities, you kind of know a lot about. What, what will people find in these books and what else do you want to share about spirit communication that you think is most un misunderstood? Well, let me tell you, let me give you one really personal example. Um, in 2000, my mother died of complications from Alzheimer's. And five years later, my dad died from complications of Parkinson's. And I, over the years, I tried to keep track of them in the afterlife through dreams. Like I would dream of my mother still using her walker and calling for my dad. Or I'd see my dad, you know, using his wheelchair. So one night, Rob taught a, a meditation course. And I think it, he did a, an eyes partially open meditation. Right? Well, anyway. So my eyes were partially open. And I was in a really relaxed state. And in a corner of the room, I suddenly saw my mother. And she was standing outside a theater, laughing and motioning people to come on into the theater. And she looked really young, like in her 30s, maybe. And then she waves at somebody. And so I looked at where she was waving, and I see my dad, who also is younger, come trotting up to her, and they looked really happy. And then they realized, I think, they both kind of turned, and there was some recognition that I could see them, and they just faded away. Yeah. I think that was also the meditation workshop where uh, I was teaching a, a six uh, sessions, and that was the sixth one, and the last one. So just as we completed the, the final moment of the meditation, the lights go out. Uh, and uh, so I think, well, maybe there was a power a short or something. We walked back, and flip on the switch, and it, it somehow had flipped off. And there's nobody, nobody was standing back there. And the, but it just came right at the perfect moment. Uh, lights out as the yeah, lights out. <laughs> Meditation ended. So my personal contact with the other side is often through uh, deceased loved ones, uh, uh, contacts with uh, uh, friends or relatives uh, who have died, like a cousin of mine. I wasn't real close to him, and I knew he had <laughs> uh, brain cancer and was was very ill. And uh, I didn't know how much longer he had left, but I had this dream. It was a very vivid dream that there he was, and he looked very healthy, which was surprising. And he was looking around and saying, 
what's happening? You know, and, and then he, he vanishes. And the next morning, my sister called me and said he had, uh, John had just died. Person. The dreams are, are from our, what we've been able to find out from our research seem to be the most common way that people initially have spirit contact. Maybe, maybe because it's so non-threatening, you know, you dream about somebody, but it's it's very vivid. Yeah, my mother had uh, some interesting uh, contacts with my father after he died. He used to sit in his chair in the den and read a lot, and. After uh, he passed, uh, my mother was sitting there, and they, uh, she, she lived in uh, Minneapolis, and it was winter, and the, the window had frosted over, and his nickname was Mac, and she looked, and there were the initials M-A-C in the frost, uh, ne right next to where he had, had sat. Another time she saw him. Yeah. That, this that, was a weird yeah, one. Yeah, this, this is one. She was in that same chair. Uh, she was kind of half asleep or half awake and uh, coming awake, and looked. There he was standing in the doorway of, of the den, and he was wearing this orange striped shirt. And she says to him, where did you get that shirt from? <laughs> uh, and he just laughs and vanishes. <laughs> you know, some of the questions I've always had about uh, medium communication or, and spirit communication, and I'd love to get your opinion on it. And I've just done a number of shows, as it turns out, with some different mediums. Um, one. I always have a hard time sorting through the discrepancies. Like I had this medium, outstanding medium, no doubt she's terrific and she's doing great work. She's doing, she's a death doula, you know, so she goes around wow. to hospice centers and helps people who are making the transition and helps families who are making this transition. And she uses her mediumistic abilities, but she also just uses good death mm -hmm. doula kind of things. But we get to talking about reincarnation. And it turns out she's from the spiritualist tradition, you know, the spiritualist church, right. and they don't really they don't believe in that, which is strange. You know, the whole belief shocking. thing, the, the belief thing is strange. You know, you, you yeah. have beliefs, you, your, your mediums, you're supposed to know all this stuff. <laughs> and then I spoke with another just delightful person, a, a medium from the UK, and she says, yeah, I, I was kind of brought up in that tradition and had that belief. And then I had this experience with this woman who kind of helped me see my past lives and helped me understand reincarnation what's going on that yeah, I don't, we, folks we, know. That we understand to be communicating with these other realms can't resolve like a basic question of <laughs> like reincarnation and what does that say in general for the information we're getting through i, I, yeah, I know i think uh we tend to think about reincarnation in linear time that this life before this life after, where if you think outside of linear time, all of these lives coexisting simultaneously. So you are your own personality, that person is own personality, but your higher self is related to all of those personalities. So maybe you look at that uh, definition, that could be one that could, you could say, okay, reincarnation doesn't exist, or you could say, yes, it does exist. No, uh, but that, he's talking about the, the actual spiritualist belief right, is that yeah. reincarnation is not real, that it no. doesn't exist. How can, they get that, yeah. how can they get that wrong? You know, if we're going to bring it down to really kind of concrete terms, you know, which I hate because right and wrong is kind of really uh, iffy, but, but that's how it comes across, right? Because people read your books and your books are, are well organized and well thought out to kind of make a case or to say how to make, for example, how to improve your chances of having spirit communication, which is totally valid. And that's what people want to know. You know, how can I communicate directly with people who've passed? Because the, and mediums will tell you that, too. You know, a lot of mediums, the best mediums will say, hey, do it yourself. That's the best right. way because they yeah. realize right. they are an intermediary and they're somewhat mm -hmm. getting in the way. But I'm, again, kind of interested in the phenomenon itself, you know, like why is there how could there be that we, we don't why is there that dogma you know why does it yeah, i don't know realm? it's, it's very mysterious i remember the first time well, there's there's a medium in casadega we know really well we've known her for years and one time in a reading i said to her i said well can you tell me about my you know past lives she goes oh there, there's we don't we don't believe in reincarnation i sat there and i was, I was just like so shocked you know it just it's okay well does that mean you're just stuck in the afterlife for all this time? I mean, what happens, you know? And she said, no, oh, you didn't explain to me what 
whatever the belief system was, you know, about what happens as you're there. And then, you know, this is kind of a related question, but something I wanted to ask you guys, that the other problem with the reincarnation thing, and I pointed it out, is that the data that we get back, so we can get all attached to the data and science and all that stuff. And there's so many problems with it. But at the same time, we have a need, we all have a desire to kind of understand things in a rational and a logical way. So if you look at the data that comes back about reincarnation, it's pretty convincing. You know, you look at those folks at the University of Virginia, uh -huh. Stevenson and Jim Tucker now, you know, and they're like, bam, they'll hit you with these case after case where the data comes through clearly and, you know, they've done it in a controlled way and they have the birthmarks and all this stuff, data, right. data, data. And then that, what, what do you do with that? What, 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 why, it, what, how do, how much do we rely on that data or to what extent is that not even a valid path to pursue? Is it just another way that we're deceiving ourselves to think sure. we can nail these things down with data? You guys have dealt with a lot of scientifically minded people. We can talk about remote viewing and Joe McConical and, you know, Stargate or, you know, any number of ways where you guys are, are familiar with science and the data that supports <clears throat> I'll tell you, let's treat all that. But Carol Bowman wrote two books uh, on children's past lives, and she actually studied with Ian Stevenson. And one of the areas where they differed, from my understanding, is that Carol felt that these regressions, rather, rather than just, you know, finding out who you were, that they're really about healing certain trauma in this life that may be related to previous lives. And she, do you know, are you familiar with the Leininger case? The, the kid who yes. was a World War <clears throat> They first contacted Carol, and she flew down to where they lived and talked to the boy. And she felt there was a, a genuine case. In fact, she wrote the introduction to their book. But what's interesting, I, I said, well, Carol, get me the chart data. I, I want to look at this kid's chart, uh, his astrology chart. So she got me the data, and they had only a time of birth and and place of birth for his previous life as a World War II pilot. But what I noticed, in, in astrology, you have the north node of the moon and the south node of the moon. The north node is the direction you're supposed to move in this lifetime to achieve all of your potential. The south node is your comfort zone, the things you've, you've mastered in previous lives. For this kid, the nodes were reversed. And I thought, well, I don't know what this means, but it's really interesting. So, you know, in answer to your question, I mean, you can collect all kinds of data, whether it's through astrology or science or whatever, and you may never have the answer. You know, the answer may still elude, elude you. Fair enough. I can, I, I can personally attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, where, where else might we go? Can we, should we tell people about, should we share with you about all this work you've done? Do Wesley. This is a do Wesley story. Wesley Meeks. Fascinating. This story, the first question I have to ask, and once they hear the story, everyone will ask the same question is, tell me this is for real. Tell me how you <laughs> verified this, because this story, folks, is just crazy, crazy story. Do we know, do we know this guy's for real? He is. He's, uh, Rob's talked to him. Yeah, right? over several years, I've communicated with him, and uh, he's a... Uh, he was a police officer for 15 years. Uh, he worked in Child Protective Services a few years, became a private uh, investigator, I think, uh, for several years. And then he uh, now is, uh, does uh, security and surveillance at a uh, Texas, he's from Texas, and uh, at a Texas uh, hospital, which is his current job. And uh, his experiences started when he was 10 years old, when he was in uh, coming from, a, I think it was a 4th July family event. They were driving home in uh, central Texas, and uh, they were the only car on the road, dark. And suddenly there was this green light about 500 feet in front of the car, and it changed colors, green, blue, red. Uh, and uh, it was there for about five minutes. As they, they didn't know what it was, and then it vanished. And like, he was very interested in it, but nobody in the family seemed to be curious and wanting to talk about it anymore. After that, 
So just just to add details, so he has like two brothers or something in the car, and his parents. yeah, he had two, a couple brothers, right, and parents. Uh, and after that, he started having out of body experiences, which he he had, he had no idea what an out of body experience was. His first one, he had lifted up and uh, out of his body, and uh, he saw floating near the ceiling. He saw his brother getting up to go to the bathroom, and then the brother came back and was shaking shaking him for him to go to the bathroom and that's when he came back down into his body and that was his first experience so he told his brother and his uh, parents uh brother laughed at him and his parents got mad at him for telling stories uh and or just i think the the father was upset and the mother said oh, it was just a dream you know uh n nothing to it and but he kept having these experiences and then he didn't he stopped talking about them to anybody uh for for That's years. the problem, yeah. you know. <laughs> for, for years, he he had these, and uh, then the uh, he was. I think he was still pretty young when, yeah, when the when the aliens got involved, they would. Uh, he had uh, he, he describes one experience where there were uh, seven or eight of these small beings, four to five feet tall. Surround. He wakes up and they're surrounding his bed, and they lift him up. Now I'm not sure whether he is out of body or in his body. Uh, well, from, from the account, from the account, the way I read it, and it's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because later when he's married, his wife it, it feels him physically moving from the bed. So he has some evidence that some of his out-of-body experiences aren't even out of body. He's in right. it and uh, moving through, the, which is also some of the data we get back from uh, encounters, alien contact stories, it's both. So sometimes it's his consciousness moving outside of the right. body, yeah. astral travel thing. It's, yeah. it's, 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 I was just reading it over and I was thinking, now was he out of body or not? <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, two of them lifted him and took his uh, arms and uh, they're hovered above the bed and spinning him around and around and around. And, and then they they all surround him, and they uh, he's in the center, and they spin around him like uh, Sufis or dancing <laughs> Sufis, uh, and I don't know what they're doing, and, uh, but uh, maybe just working with them, uh, you know, just like this uh, Susan woman that were the veterinarian, the, the veterinarian uh, has similar unusual experiences with these beings, and uh, so you know. Then he uh, starts to d doing these explorations on his own. It doesn't always involve uh, uh, ETs. And uh, one Tell day- about the bar. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we love the story. This, this is, you know, this is an unusual. He feels that he has developed the ability to manipulate matter while out of body. So he goes to a topless bar <laughs> and he sees another guy who's out of, out of body at the bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it sounds like a joke. <laughs> but so uh, the waitress walks by and he reaches out and grabs her. She's wearing these short shorts, grabs her, hooks <laughs> under the band, pulls down the shorts and the underwear down to her knees. She drops her drink, spins around, looking for the drunk. Doesn't see anybody. <laughs> and then he, the other guy who's uh, out of body, he just shakes his head like that. <laughs> Very strange story. Uh, yeah, you know, now, yeah. let, let's add a couple things to this story because it's going to get even even wilder, <laughs> and, and it's the way that people love to kind of engage with this, particularly in the way that you guys do. Because I first wanted to establish that you know this is somebody you've actually talked to; it's a real person, and he does have this background. Police is a cop, you know, cop, right. trained observer. Uh, the other thing that, correct me if I'm wrong, but at some point he verifies with his brother, and his brother says, "Yeah, I didn't want to talk about it, but yeah, I remember that experience too. I remember that first encounter on July 4th." And I, you mm -hmm. know, and you hear this over and over again with families, yeah. you know, where everyone right. just kind of buries it, or sometimes it's subconsciously buried, but. There's reason he has independent verification that some of this stuff happened. And then the other part, like you mentioned, 
hit later he gets married and he has verification of his he's complaining he's sharing some of this stuff with his wife and then at some point you now he's moving off the bed and he's cold as ice when he comes back to the bed so there's kind of this contact with the physical world and then yeah. we launch into these other stories that you're telling like with the bar thing is unbelievable and then yeah what the happens story is the what happens in the astral realm stays in the astral realm <laughs> that that's, you have to that share was, because that that's was really I told Whitney Strieber that story, and he said, what? <laughs> you know, we're, we're thinking of this place of knowledge, the Akashic Record. He, he decided he wanted to go to the Akashic Record, and so he goes off into the cosmos, <laughs> soaring. It's, he, he says it started like a Star Trek episode where you go, whoosh, yeah. uh, everything, the stars are like lines. Uh, you're shooting through uh, space, and then he's, he thinks about what he thinks thinks of the Akashic Record as this vast mansion. He, he thinks about the mansion, and then uh, he slows down and stops, and there's this mansion. He's hovering above it, and he, he says it's hard to describe. It's so huge and so beautiful, and there's all of these different rooms, and each room has this incredible large base on it that has this art, and uh, it's just incredible, and that, that's the stories of the individuals uh, each one, each person has this, supposedly has this room in this vast mansion. And uh, so we're, we're waiting, you know, I'm waiting to hear this, what, what's, what's all the knowledge that he's <laughs> gaining? And then it, it turns into something else completely that he goes down in the center, uh, there in the plaza area, and he, he meets this older woman uh, wearing this long dress and uh, she she approaches him and uh, kind of acting like a guy. And at some point, she tells him that I'm not really an older woman, <laughs> but I can change my images to uh, I I feel comfortable like this, and people don't recognize me. And he he didn't. He said I always wanted to ask what why he was concerned about being recognized. She was being concerned about being recognized, but so. That's Anyhow, weird. in a flash, she uh, she changes, and she's a younger woman, uh, and uh, very attractive. Uh, she, no, she was not uh, average looking. I, I guess. No, I, I love the way you know the details. The way he tells the story. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> because first, let me just add a couple of things. One yeah. is that he really is. She really is sharing some deep knowledge, and there is this kind of telepathic download where she's able to answer all these questions so right. like what we normally say with a spiritual higher ordered being and then she yeah. shifts and he goes you know like, like such a guy you know such a justice guy yeah she was hot you know she was pretty good you know she was, you know, it was super hot you know but she was, yeah she was pretty good looking <laughs> and suddenly they don't have any clothes on and uh then he wonders did i ever have any clothes on and uh and so he can tell that she wants to have sex. And this, uh, we wrote about this on our blog in, a, in several <laughs> different uh, uh, episodes, and it uh, became very controversial. Some people were very upset by this story of going to the Akashic Record and having sex. Uh, <laughs> and they thought this was some kind of lower being that- well, uh, Wait a minute, because he, he, oh, he doesn't have sex here. I mean- No, he has he an orgasmic experience. Has <laughs> the most- amazing and and also you know talk about tantric stuff he's not talking about it just in terms of sex although this is a guy who likes no. to out of body travel to topless <laughs> bars he's talking yeah. about it as true spiritual union of these this, levi this is levitation sex too. Levitations, yeah. i mean everything you could buy <laughs> omni magazine here baby i mean this is <laughs> prime stuff you know so it's it's all that 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 stuff that that kind of touches on all these things and then also i want to emphasize the other point which is to me really important. Like you post it to your forum and you get some really smart people and some deep people on your forum who are going, Hey, I'm, you know, I have spirit communication abilities and I think this is a lower realm. Other people yeah. know not necessarily. So we're going to talk a minute, you know, people need to check out your blog because you guys post a lot of this stuff there. It's an ongoing community and there's some deeper thought that you guys follow up with on that. So I'm sorry, but I want to share all that because it's fantastic. Right. Please continue with the story. Yeah. Well, that's true. In fact, one of the women who, who commented on this, uh, Connie Cannon, we talk about her in Aliens in the Backyard because she's had a lot of experience with, with abductions and out-of-body travel, this kind of thing. And she felt 
Connie's thing was, we don't really know how complicated the other side is or how complicated, you know, when you go out of your body, we don't, we don't really know. And you know, the matrix of reality is, is vastly complex. Yeah, and she's had uh, experience with uh, somebody, uh, one of her former doctors who became very, <laughs> cute, very close to, and uh, she uh, had contact with him in a uh, sexual manner and she said that it was it was similarly incredible, like uh, nothing uh, beyond any kind of sexual experience that uh, uh, she has ever had. Uh, and that's the, the same thing that that he said. It was, uh, you know, just went, seemed to go on and on, and it was just uh, kind of makes you want to die. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I I think that I, I love the openness that you have about that because just in the sense that. I think it, it it's to me the only way to really understand to even to begin to understand the data is to look at the possibilities and take I don't think we have to take everyone's story and give them equal weight that's not what I'm saying but when we find like you do people and you vet them the best you can and you get these accounts I like the way you guys are able to just lay these out in a book and then say okay you know, they don't all fit together perfectly mm -hmm. with one answer kind of thing. And that's certainly the story with Wes Meeks. I mean, and I'm yeah. like, not trying to pigeonhole it down and say, well, it either has to be true in this sense or it has to be that way. Right. So how does the story, how does the story end? You guys are still in contact with Wes. He's still having a, a different experiences, but he's still in that astral realm kind of thing. Right, yeah, yeah. But he's not, he's a little frustrated because he's not getting out that much anymore. And uh, so uh, he's, uh, last couple of times I've talked to him, he's, he, he would actually like to be a psychic detective uh, using his abilities. And uh, I told him that's a very difficult uh, yeah. route to go because, uh, uh, we we did some writing on uh, an investigation of the psychic detectives, and one man uh, actually, because he knew so much about this murder, uh, is the Boston Strangler case actually that he became a suspect uh, and all the, the time. The, all the yeah. time, I've talked to a bunch of psychic uh, detectives on the show, and th if, if you're going to go into that. Field, the first thing you have to know is you, you're going to be a suspect in every case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, because you know too much. Yeah. <laughs> and because Boston Stranger was able to get in and talk his way into these women's houses. And uh, so now they thought, w without having to break in, uh, and now they thought, well, he's trying to talk his way into the police investigation too. And this this could, because he, uh, this, this could be him. And what they did is they gave him this truth serum of a combination. This is George of, Hardy. George yeah. Hardy, right. Yeah, we gave him a combination of drugs that uh, affected his nervous system for the rest of his life. And we met him like 20, 25 years after the Boston Strangler case, and he was very upset, still very upset about that. And, and yeah, but not in good physical health. You know, I spoke with a medium uh, not too long ago, again, just a delightful person and somebody I really liked at the end of the day and respected. But her first experience, like, this ties in a couple of the different uh, stories we've been talking about already, but she had an experience with her mom passing that opened her up psychically. And then in this opening up, a spirit comes to her and says, I want you to help me resolve my case. I was murdered and I'd like justice. And you'll hear about wow. this. I'm sure you guys can attest yeah. to this. You'll hear about this a lot from people who get into the psychic detective stuff. And some people go there and some people don't. She didn't want to go there. But the spirit kept pestering her. So finally, she calls the local police department and says, here's what I have. And she immediately becomes a suspect. But she's kind of got a family and she has a pretty good alibi. So she's able to get over that. But it's pretty upsetting in her life. But the other thing that, that happens with it, a couple things happen with it. One is it doesn't lead to a prosecution, which is yeah. the other thing that, that skeptics particularly have a problem with, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. well, then, you know, they got him, right? It's like, no, they can give all the information in the world and it might not lead to a conviction because there's this whole legal process. And in her case, the detective, after he retired from the case, years later, a couple of years later, contacted her and said, 
I'd like to work with you more because we weren't able to do anything. We think you're right about who you oh. identified as the suspect, but we weren't able to go there. Now I'm a private investigator. I want to go there. The other interesting thing about... Was it resolved? No, never, and it never, never was resolved, which wow. brings up a bunch of interesting questions again, back to the, you know, what happens in the astral realm stays in the yeah, astral realm. Yeah, really. <laughs> they, they can't, they, the, this person who's stuck in the astral realm is trying to resolve their case, their case isn't, isn't resolved. It isn't meant to be resolved or whatever. And so, I mean, do you have any, any thoughts about that? And also this medium had the ability to talk to ET. And I wonder why other mediums don't lead with, oh yeah, of course I'm talking to beings from other planets all the time. But again, that seems to be outside of the, strangely outside of the, 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 the swing zone for a lot. We had back in 1987, I think it was when Adam Walsh vanished, a friend of ours, Renee Wiley, who was an artist and psychic was working with a Cooper city cop and he wanted to drive around the mall where Adam was last seen and Renee was an empath. And so they're driving along and all of a sudden Renee started gasping and then she just started sobbing. She said, Adam Walsh was decapitated. And about two weeks, three weeks later, they found his decapitated body. It's, no, it's, they only found his head. Oh, they only found his head. That's right. And so years later, we were with Renee. The, a young girl had disappeared from Green Acres, Florida. So Renee says, do you guys want to come with me to the police station and see how I do this? I said, sure. So we went to the police station. She, Renee did her thing. She handled the little girl's toys. And eventually she led the police to this field that was fenced in. And she said, I think the body's in there. And I believe that the boyfriend did it. You know, the other interesting thing about that story, and in a way, it kind of brings us back full circle to the synchronicity thing, doesn't it? <laughs> and, uh, I, I wanted to throw in Marissa Ryan was the the medium that I was Marissa. referring to that that and the, her connection with ET I think was really kind that of is it. And that she's she's talking to ET, and it, again, it blows me away. If, you know, why isn't if, if if ET is out there, then why isn't every medium leading with and of course, you know, E.T. is out there, too. And I talk to E.T. all the time. But well, I think E.T. should be on your show. <laughs> I don't know. You know, maybe maybe E.T. has been. Who knows? This been, we're, we're probably reaching the time limit of what people can bear to hear. Because we can go on and on and on. This is, we haven't talked about a lot of these topics, so we'll ha love to have you guys back on it. Yeah, that'd be great. There's a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot, lot more, including Rob and I are yoga bros, and uh, yes. not only teaches meditation, but he teaches yoga. I, I didn't start doing yoga until I was 40 years old. Now I've done it for uh, 31 years. <laughs> so, oh, well, that's sure. awesome. I've done it for a lot of years, too. And you mentioned, you know, I, Iyengar and my first teacher in Dallas was uh, you know, of that lineage and actually brought Iyengar to Dallas and it, huh. you know, it, whole yeah. interesting thing to talk about there. I want to talk about the dark side because Iyengar was not a very nice guy and he was kind of, <laughs> kind of I've mean, read. Yeah, yeah. kind of mean to some of his students. And I even saw that firsthand in a little, you know, uh, workshop that we did where, you know, he kind of had not evolved in so much in <laughs> with all those downward dogs that he, that he did. <laughs> So the, the spiritual path is interesting and the, the dark spiritual path. Why are some of these people who seem to be advanced seem to be doing some kind of pretty mm. weird things, which has an interesting link back to the Wes Meek story and that we uh -huh. will be perfect. And he's not perfect, but I love the way that he says he's not perfect. But that <laughs> raises a bunch of interesting questions about, yeah. you know, what is, what is true spirituality what is our yeah. path See, well, one other thing about west meeks is that he had sent me his uh two notebooks of journals and i'd gone through that he had uh taken notes after these experiences and it was very interesting going through them and when i got to the one on the akashic record it, it, it differed a little bit from his telling it because he told it like he didn't know what the akashic record was but he, he was saying that it was this this, uh, this place where there's this mansion of knowledge. Uh, but in the journal, he, he writes Akashic Record right at the top. So 
uh, you know, a little difference mm -hmm. like that, but essentially the story was the same though that he that he wrote, that he had written. And wow. he made take of telling his wife who threatened oh, to that, divorce him. Oh, that's the other part of the story. <laughs> yeah, his wife uh, was very upset when uh, found out that the, the best sexist was from uh, the Akashic Record woman. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, we have to throw that in. I'm, I'm sorry I left that out because that's a great part of that story. Is <laughs> it's so, it's so, you know, it's so human. Uh, on, on, it is like, human. It's like, I mean, who writes this story down? But he wants to write it down in his journal. I guess that's yeah. human enough. He, you know, he wants to remember it. He wants it, and he locks it up, and his wife finds it. Finds it. Yeah. And, oh but, you know, this is like a question that, like, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with these experiences I'm pretty dense but I have been able to lucid dream mainly through my son who was a lucid dreamer from an early age and was telling me yeah you know this is this is happens to oh, me all the time. you know and it kind of sparked my curiosity and seeing if that's real and anyone who lucid dreams if they're honest about it one of the first things they'll talk about is you know <laughs> what do you right? you know can you, can you have sex <laughs> yeah. and then it, it raises that same question of well, yeah. what, what are your what are your obligations or your responsibilities? <laughs> right, yeah. Responsibilities if you're married. Yeah. So our buddy Wes Meeks, he, he, <laughs> he has this incredible sexual experience, but then he writes it down and his wife <laughs> gets it and she's pissed off. I mean, that is in this real world, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's the epitome of being human. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and even this woman we're working with now who is some is veterinarian, highly evolved person, uh, she goes out of her body and has the has experience too. Grabs this guy and uh, they start doing. It. And she she writes it and very puts it right out front. Uh, you know, and she she wonders why I did that, but it was great. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, yeah. you know, the other thing I wanted to point people to, and I just pulled it up. Synchrosecrets.com. Yeah. Yeah, I've got Synchro Secrets is the other. Uh, yeah. You can see it up there, but you really have to visit it. Just pulling it up there doesn't do it justice, but. Yeah. I'll have links in the show notes to all of that. And these books, folks, good books. And, you know, if you're um, an Amazon person and if you have the Amazon Unlimited, like a lot right. of you I know have, you're going to be able to. Now, this isn't helping these authors out and we need to help these <laughs> authors out, but they've established a pretty good career. So I don't need to worry too much about them. But a lot of these books are available for free read on Amazon. So take advantage of that. But you'll get a sense for well-written books, well-researched books that deliver on what they promise. So, you know, the seven secrets of synchronicity, you can say, oh, gee, you know, that sounds a little, <laughs> a little too worked over by the publisher, but it really works. I mean, there's some good, solid advice in there. It's laid out in a way that you can follow it. And then some of these other books are just incredible in their own right. Tell us, tell us more about, before we let you go, Tell us more about some of the books that people find most interesting, surprising. Rob, you got to tell us about the Indiana Jones books. <laughs> people are not going to believe that you did that. You also wrote a book with uh, the Jedi Master, Billy T. Williams. <laughs> yeah, two, two books, Billy D. Williams, and I worked for George Lucas for two years writing seven Indiana Jones novels, starting with The Last Crusade, which I got the script. I gave me the script and uh, I adapted it into a novel and that was on the New York Times bestseller list. So they said, well, you want to try some original uh, Indiana Jones novels? And it was his idea to uh, go back to like prequels before the movies, the 1920s to do the 1920s, and which is what I did in the, the six original ones. And you know, they, they were you know, pretty much open to uh, stories that I wanted to pursue. They didn't, uh, you know, have a, a lot of uh, uh, restrictions at all. That uh, George's thing is that the uh, the mystical object has to be a real object uh, that we know about from legend. That you can't just make something up out of whole cloth. That it has to be uh, like the Omphalos in uh, the Peril of Delphi. The first one was an actual uh, object, uh, a mystical object, and so. That was pretty much it. And, uh, you know, those books, uh, it was one after another. I had four months uh, to write one, the deadline. And then I had to start the next day on the next one. And they, there were a lot of uh, 
travel as Indiana Jones is, you know, I'm going uh, all over the world. And, uh, and we didn't have the internet at that time either when I wrote those in the early late 80s, early 90s. And, uh, but fortunately, I, my younger years, um, I would work at a newspaper for a year or two, save money, and then travel overseas, so Central, South America, Europe, uh, North Africa. And so I had a lot of, uh, you know, personal travel experiences. And I always went to the, uh, to the, to the ruins because when I started college, I wanted to be an archeologist actually. <laughs> and uh, uh, I found out that uh, there were more, jo more jobs in journalism. And uh, that's, so I uh, uh, became uh, a reporter. I got a degree in uh, mass communications and journalism worked on newspapers for 12 years before I met Trish and moved to freelance. But I, I, had, I would take these trips up to six months uh, just on my own, uh, traveling uh, different parts of the world. And that really helped out for the Indiana Jones novels. What do you think, a lot of people are, are going to be super curious about that. What do you make about maybe the deeper connection of Indiana Jones with all the other work that you've done. Do you think Lucas was and is tapping into some deeper meaning there? It certainly seems like he's on the, on the I verge think of that. The archetype, you know. Yeah, um, there's something special about the Indiana Jones character. He is uh, a legendary character and archetype of adventure and mm -hmm. everybody knows him. And, uh, you know, uh, that's how, you know, People ask me, well, what do you write about and what kind of books do you write? And I, I, I always tell them, well, you may not know my name, but you're, you're going to know the, one of my characters. Uh, I didn't create the character, but I, I gave him uh, part of his uh, early life. Uh, and we got to go to Skywalker Ranch, yeah. which I'll tell you <laughs> was amazing. And it was in the days before they had security. Right, that's where uh, Lucas... Uh, uh, at his uh, headquarters. Produ headquarters, production studio. He had the most amazing library. It was just filled with occult books. It was round. He had a ladder that went around the room. And Megan, our daughter, was only about eight months old, I think, when we went. And she, she just crawled around on the floor. And I said, Megan, here's something you can tell your kids. You got to go to Skywalker Ranch and crawl around on the floor <laughs> in their library. Well, that is a story to tell. That is a story to tell. <laughs> well, you guys have been awesome, and thanks for sharing so much. Well, thank you. You're really, you're a great host. Oh, uh, uh, it's, it's easy. It's easy when you pick the right guest, which my <laughs> audience did for me here. So, again, first of, of many chats, because we really have scratched the surface, but if you were in the dark about these amazing folks, Rob and Trish McGregor, please don't stay in the dark go ahead and <laughs> out and check out all their books y'all have a great day and thanks. yeah you too alex thanks so much thank you alex Bye now. thanks again to rob and trish mcgregor for joining me today on skeptico and thanks to mike patterson for helping connect me with them and pointing them in my direction so it was a great chat i really enjoyed it i'm going to tee up one kind of weird question here from all the different things that we talked about what do you make of the Wes Meeks case? I mean, I, I think it speaks to so many of the issues with this interview. One is, are these researchers, are these authors credible? Have they done their due diligence in finding this case? Because if we do take this case at face value, it raises so many of the questions we have about the extended consciousness realm. I don't think it's wrong to question the trickster or the malevolent aspect of a spirit that gets involved in this way. But maybe that's too narrow of a definition to think that all interactions we would have with some kind of divine God would be a certain way. So it raises all those kind of questions. It also raises a bunch of questions about the Akashic field and the Akashic records, which I find incredibly oversimplistic in a way that makes me question it again. So there's so many questions around that narrow little case that I find interesting. And that's the reason I wanted to tee it up. So let me know your thoughts on that. I always point people to the skeptical forum for communicating, especially with me and people who are really listening to the show and 
desiring to have greater interaction, like I am, about these topics, Skeptico Forum is the place to go. And you can get there from the Skeptico website, skeptiko.com. There you can find all our previous shows, over 400 of them that you can download, listen to, share with people you think should be hearing it. Well, I have a number of interesting shows coming up. Do stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. Thank you.